Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Again, thanks for braving the snow and uh, being here this morning. I'm Captain Austin Minter uh, from the Army Cyber Institute. Today's track on cyber strategy and policy will cover topics on institutional cooperation against cybercrime, Russia's cyber information confrontation strategy, and building responsible nation state norms and behavior in cyberspace. Our presenters today will be Joe Bell, Kyle Vicino, Nina Kohlers, and Major General Retired John Davis. Our first presenter will be Joe Bell Kyle Vicino from the University of California at Berkeley. Joe Bell is a software engineer, writer, political activist, and cybersecurity enthusiast. His research interests include cybersecurity, international relations, and cyber espionage. Joe Bell has previously worked at Berkeley's Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science and PayPal Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. He currently works at a hearing loss prevention startup in London. Today, Joe Bell will be presenting his paper, United by Necessity, Conditions for Institutional Cooperation Against Cybercrime. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, Is it working? Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, as uh, mentioned earlier, my name is Joe Belvacino. I am from the University of California, Berkeley. Actually, more accurately, I was previously of the University of California, Berkeley. I uh, recently just graduated with my bachelor's degree about three months ago or so. So for any of you students out there, or cadets out there in the audience, uh, remember that you too in a year can be up here and look eminently underqualified compared to your fellow panelists. Um, so here today I want to talk a little bit about cybercrime and co international cooperation to deal with cybercrime. Um, so to give a little bit of background, obviously everyone here has some uh, intuition or notion of what cybercrime is doing, but uh, in terms of how much it's actually costing, it's estimated that it's cost uh, the world economy around $6 billion a year. So this was an estimate as of 2016. Uh, so it's outdated. It's actually increased a lot in the last few years. And in the last two decades, states have been grappling with this new reality, with the fact that a lot of crime has been moved into cyberspace in order to try to mitigate and um, improve the situation. Uh, institutional solutions, particularly ones uh, that have been grafted within the European Union, have been present in the last... Uh, five to eight years or so. So before I begin, I want to give a little bit of uh, context into what we all think of as cybercrime, right? Like when we look at this from a uh, general audience point of view, people think of some malicious hacker that goes on. There's lots of uh, numbers and letters on the screen or the blue background, and they break into Fort Knox and steal all the money, right? Uh, from an academic point of view, this is actually a little more... Um, complicated and also a little less complicated, which is kind of funny to think about. Essentially, here for the purposes of this presentation and going forward, what I want to define cybercrime as um, is offenses committed with the help of computer data and systems. So this is an all-encompassing definition that was uh, postulated by Elaine Fahey uh, back in 2014. There's a lot of different kinds of definitions out there for cybercrime, but this is the one generally adopted by international institutions when they're uh, looking to mitigate it. So we're going to go ahead and adopt the same kind of definition. And to give a little context into the case study that we're doing here, we're focusing mainly on Europol. Uh, for those of you that aren't, uh, that aren't familiar with Europol, uh, it is the European Union's essentially police agency. It is composed of 28 member states. Uh, those member states opt in based on agreements. So they have to opt in to a provision on the Treaty of Lisbon that has to do with... Uh, European collective defense security. Uh, the most recent country to opt in actually has been Denmark. Uh, they originally did not back in 2013 and then re-opted in 2015. Uh, the focus in Europol is generally operational support and intelligence exchange. So they have a couple of different kinds of uh, tools for this, primarily uh, the Siena system, which is a secure intelligence exchange system that runs between different uh, police agencies of different countries. Uh, also, just generally helping out with things like um, investigations, uh, operational support, uh, malware analysis, password cracking, and so on. Okay. And within 
the, within Europol itself is the European Cyber Crime Center. So this was a con constituent organization within Europol that specifically focuses on cyber crime mitigation. It was recently established in 2013, and a lot of the functionalities that I just mentioned is housed within this center. Um, it is one, I think, of two main center or two main groups within Europol that focuses primarily on cybercrime. The other one being the Joint Task Force on Cybercrime uh, Mitigation. And uh, this is, according to the EU's cybersecurity strategy that they released in the last two years, the focal institution, as defined by policymakers, for fighting cybercrime within the European Union. Okay. So the big puzzle that I want to be considering here is this. Uh, there's been a lot of work that's been done to examine what states can do to fight against cybercrime, but what hasn't been done is what compels states to cooperate with one another or cooperate with an institution to fight cybercrime. Uh, so some questions that come up here are under what conditions, for example, do state law enforcement uh, agencies cooperate with an international institution? Uh, what do differing conditions end up warranting different kinds of cooperations? And then when states do cooperate, why do they cooperate? For what purpose? Right? Are they doing it just for operational support? Do they do it because they want to build some sort of capacity? Do they do it because of a mix of the three? What is the most important thing to them? So in essence, what drives state police agencies to cooperate through an international institution to fight cybercrime? And why is this a really important case study for us to look at? Well, Europol usually only supports member states at the request of a member state. In other words, it is non-hierarchical. There isn't much in terms of enforcing cooperation between states that the organization can do. So uh, we're, for a lot of these cases, they have to come together and state agencies have to choose to, be, to cooperate within this uh, institution. So this creates a lot of um, interesting Essentially, when you take away the, uh, the stick, right, this essentially leaves the carrot for different organizations and different agencies to want to work within this greater uh, organization. So what types of cooperation are we going to be looking at here? Uh, so I've postulated three different kinds of cooperation uh, that may drive states to work within uh, Europol to fight against cybercrime. Uh, the first one is called iterative cooperation. Uh, the second one is cooperation by substitution. And the third is cooperation by self-reliance. I'll be going through each one of these and then showing how we're going to be testing for each type of cooperation uh, throughout this uh, presentation. So the very first one I want to be taking a look at is something called iterative cooperation. Uh, so this essentially works off a framework developed by Vinod Agarwal back in 1998. It's been co-opted by a couple of different political scientists over time. Uh, the idea here is that the pre-existence of an institution uh, makes member states more willing to give it or to expand the writ of that institution. Uh, so this is an example of what is called subsist uh, subsistive issue linkage. Essentially, what that means is that if there is a field of study or a field that is closely related to the other field that uh, you want to be expanding into, an organization that takes uh, focus on the first field is going to be the one that's going to be expanded upon. Right? Uh, so the other thing to consider here when it comes to rational institutional design theory is that when states are generally risk averse, when they don't necessarily know what the impact of the problem is, they're more willing to uh, work within institutions or work within organizations that they already know very well and expand the writ of those organizations. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so how do we end up testing this inside of this uh, for this paper? Well, we look at the cited importance of U Europol for fighting cybercrime despite the existence of um, comparable domestic cybercrime capabilities with EU state crime agencies. Uh, we also generally look at uh, what policymakers consider to be the um, most important cybercrime fighting institution uh, throughout the EU. The second form of cooperation that I want to be looking at here is cooperation by substitution. So this is the idea that member states should only cooperate with an organization if it provides something that the member state can't produce for itself, whether because it's politically or physically infeasible to do so. Uh, so this hypothesis focuses on the idea that what state agencies are doing or what national crime agencies are doing are, is that they're um, cooperating within this institution in order to make up for some sort of capability that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do on their own. 
Uh, so how do we end up testing this? Well, we take a look at domestic sector size for ICT employment, uh, and then we also quantify interactions between uh, private firms through Europol and outside of Europol. Uh, so what we look at here is essentially how big is the information communications technology sector of the domestic state institutions or domestic states and see whether or not they're going to be doing most of their work essentially outside of the organization uh, domestically or within the organization of Europol. And the last form of cooperation that I want to be looking at is called cooperation for self-reliance. So this is a capacity building argument and it's been posited forward by a lot of different uh, people that have studied cybercrime and cybersecurity in general that capacity building is the most important thing out there for uh, state police agencies to be able to focus on. Uh, so this is an example of what we call the changing bargaining or of changing your uh, bargaining position within a bargaining game. Uh, essentially states are trying to change their own starting position that way they're better off within the, um, the bargaining game itself. Bargaining game in this case would be defined as uh, international cybercrime or international cybercrime mitigation. Uh, and essentially, how this differs from the previous form of cooperation, cooperation by substitution, is that for cooperation by substitution, you're focusing or you're working within an organization because you can't develop those capacities. In this situation, you're cooperating within an organization because you're looking to develop capacities that can be created immediately or within a short time period. Okay, so how do we end up testing this? Well, we take a look at uh, the categorization of capacity building activities such as education, uh, training, support provided by Europol. Uh, so this is primarily drawn from a literature typology uh, that was uh, produced back in 2016 and then expanded upon 2018. Uh, primarily, this is to focus on whether or not states, when they're, focus they're cooperating within Europol end up working mostly to bring in trainings or to bring in um, people, experts, to be able to support and expand the uh, skill of the organization or the abilities of their organization. So the methodology here that we're using is that uh, we gather data both qualitatively and quantitatively, so essentially going through different, um, different policy uh, briefs, uh, policy briefs that have been released, data sets that have been released by the European Union, uh, results of qualitative surveys that have been presented to various police agencies, uh, results of a quantitative survey that was pr also presented to various European police agencies, uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, or, and then um, interviews that were conducted with uh, policymakers in the EU, particularly within the European Cybercrime Center. Uh, for the purposes of this presentation, uh, the survey results came from the British National Crime Agency, or cybercrime unit, and then the last one, or the quantitative survey came from the Danish National Cybercrime Center, NC3. Uh, and generally the findings that were shown from all of this data that was collected is that uh, iterative cooperation is the primary driver. So EU policymakers see Europol as the focal institution to fight against cybercrime, state police agencies, um, see cybercrime as a problem that must be tackled internationally through a common process. And the organization itself doesn't really see, so Europol doesn't see a need to institute any sort of stricter measures. When I spoke with, um, with Philip Amon about this at Europol, he basically said that he believes that when states don't use Europol or produce uh, materials that are already uh, produced by Europol, uh, Europol teams or Europol officials, the big reason why that is the case is because they're just not doing enough to advertise what capabilities they can provide state agencies. Uh, so you see a lot of duplication of capabilities that happen. Uh, and it's also important to note that the pre-existence of institution, if you were to think about this in IR terms, uh, cuts down on the transaction costs and uncertainty due to the fact that you know what the infrastructure is. The Policymakers and policy elites within that institution or within that country's national crime agency already know the kinds of players they're dealing with. And the relationships have been pre-established. So this is an interesting uh, result that comes out of the NC3 survey. Uh, you'll note here that most of the interactions that occur with Europol and EC3 
essentially make up about 1 to 20 percent of the total anti-cybercrime activities that NC3 undertakes. Everything else, or most of everything else, happens domestically. The other interesting thing to note is that the, jet, the 2016 ICT sector employment percentage compared to the average in the EU is higher. So it's about um, half a standard deviation higher than it is on average. What that essentially means is that the information communications technology sector, essentially the tech sector within uh, Denmark, is larger than it is um, on average throughout Europe. So what that means is that they're purporting in their survey that they still need Europol because they think that it's an international problem. It needs to be solved internationally. Um, it can't be dealt with on a country by country basis. And despite the fact that most of their anti cybercrime activities are happening domestically, theoretically, without the need to have an international organization to come in and help them out or to support them, they still think it's more important to be able to work within that organization and cooperate within it. So this is very much a, um, a situation where it's not a zero-sum game. Essentially, you see the pie get bigger. And uh, to be able to mitigate cybercrime effectively, a lot of these agencies, or the agencies at least that I spoke with, uh, see that uh, you need to take every opportunity that's available to you, whether or not your actual interactions and your actual work um, is internationally focused. So that's yeah, mostly stuff that I went through. So the limits that uh, have been fo found for this paper, most of this focuses on primary sources with a little bit of quantitative analysis and public um, information that has been cleared by officials to be released. A lot of national agencies, when they got back to me, purported not to have this data. I don't actually believe that to be the case a lot of the time, especially when you have a country like Denmark that can answer you immediately, and then you have different countries that say, no, we don't collect that. That's, uh, that's for my personal opinion, like, I don't necessarily believe that's the case. But um, to be able to do a really robust study, you'd, be, you'd have to collect uh, the same reams of data throughout state agencies, and this is something that I'm continuing to work on. Um, I've gotten back a couple of responses since uh, this iteration of the paper was produced, but I'm looking to uh, continue to try to get a more robust data set going. Okay, so the conclusions that drawn from this paper generally is that it doesn't really make sense to reinvent the wheel. Right? If you're looking at trying to expand international cooperation, it looks like it makes more sense to look at institutions that exist that have a writ that's already related to the issue area that you're taking a look at and try to expand that, the writ of that organization. That means that uh, that organization already has reasonable credibility and it encourages states to be more willing to cooperate. And that cybercrime's ubiquitous nature, the fact that it's so omnipresent everywhere, um, it, it encourages cooperation itself because the size and the scope of the problem is so large, even if it means that you're trading intelligence away to another state, um, you're okay with doing that because you really need to fix this. So that's essentially it. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, Joe Bell, uh, over the course of your research, uh, did you find that uh, time or, or the timeline of how to develop uh, some of these cooperative efforts uh, would impact uh, different countries? Is there is there one strategy? Can a, can a country take on and try to do all types of cooperation at once, or is there um, some maturity that's involved in choosing different strategies? Um, so generally speaking, when it comes to how countries uh, work within cooperative or work within cooperative schemas in order to uh, mitigate something like cybercrime is that they kind of take a multi-pronged strategy and that they try to, to take a look at everything at once. Um, in the cases where you had countries that weren't already included in some of these institutions, so going back to the Denmark case, um, you had a very, very quick, uh, basically double, like, double guessing, right? Essentially like, it was a situation where you had about a year and a half or so of um, policymakers and people within the country saying, okay, we don't necessarily need this, and then in about a year's time deciding otherwise they need it. So it is very much a 
the way that I think state agencies are purported from my research, the way that state agencies look at it is if an opportunity exists and they think it's a credible opportunity, then they will take it. Um, in particular, a lot of these networks are pre-existing. Um, in cybercrime circles, a big uh, issue-based network that happens or a big issue-based cooperation scheme that happens focuses around limiting child pornography. And those are mostly with organizations that already exist. Um, that is, are based in that space. So again, it is a matter of having the a fact that you know already the kind of people you're dealing with, um, the kind of organization that you're dealing with. Thank you for your thoughts. I'm, I'm curious uh, how often or if at all you were looking at what the private sector is doing to supplement or support or work against um, these, these initiatives? So there's a couple of different things the private sector is doing in terms of um, international cybercrime cooperation. In a lot of these cases, it's actually really interesting because some companies do have more anti-cybercrime and just cybersecurity capabilities that outpace countries that are members of the constituent states um, or the members of these organizations. Uh, so a lot of the reason, a lot of the capacity building argument uh, relies on the idea that if you're working with this organization, because this organization happens to have partnerships with other companies, um, with Kapersky, for example, or Microsoft or Symantec, that they'll be able to go in and say, hey, like, we'll basically give you or help you facilitate a partnership with them. Um, help increase anti-cybercrime um, mitigation and efforts and so on. Uh, the agencies themselves purported, so this is primarily findings that came from the British, that the um, organizations, even though they're willing to do public declarations of partnerships, they're very unwilling to do any actual operational support because there's a lot of legal and potentially um, hazardous uh, public perception issues that they can run into. So in terms of actual direct operational support, um, it depends on the country, but from the point of view of some of the crime agencies or the national crime agencies, they're not really seeing as much as they would like. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind here is that uh, the Danish case is really interesting because a lot of their uh, not private sector uh, interactions if you saw the chart earlier, occur mostly through uh, Europe or mostly outside of Europe. So they're doing it domestically with a lot of private sector groups, either internationally or domestically within Denmark. Um, that being said, uh, it's clear that there's still a lot of, uh, they still utilize the organization in order to interface with some of these, uh, some of these private sector firms. So they find it important. Private sector groups aren't necessarily doing as much as they can or they probably should, um, and there's a lot that goes into that, uh, both political, market forces, other things. Hi, how does GDPR affect your um, partnership capabilities um, in these endeavors? Uh, so essentially, I'm gonna go with the Alex Stamos answer, which is no one actually has any idea. Um, Working within a, from my own person, so this is actually bringing in some of my own personal perspective. Working within a startup right now in London, I can tell you that like we're not, everyone's not entirely sure for a lot of the companies what a lot of this means um, in terms of regulations, in terms of partnerships. Uh, there has been some pushback, particularly against companies that are focusing on advertising because those are the ones that feel the immediate hit particularly when it comes to cookies. Um, for the moment, there's a lot of questions as to, in the future, will it necessarily hurt cooperation? Will it help? Obviously, there's a lot of um, the data collection and destruction directives that exist within GDPR make things a little murky when it comes to operational support with cybercrime. Um, that being said, they, the organizations as far as I'm aware and as far as they're willing to divulge because obviously they're not willing to say everything because a lot of it is still sensitive. Um, they're still working with a lot of 
of private sector firms to engage in large scale operations to take down networks. Joe Bell, on behalf of the Army Cyber Institute, thank you for your talk thank today. You. Thank you so Our next presenter will be Nina Collars from the Naval War College. Nina is an Associate Professor of Strategic T Studies and Operations Research at the Naval War College and is a non-resident fellow at the Modern War Institute at West Point. Nina's research interests include cybersecurity and military innovation, and she's published in numerous publications. Nina is currently working on a book on how white hat hackers can contribute to national security. Today, Nina will be presenting her paper, Feed the Bears and Starve the Trolls, Demystifying Russia's Cyber Information Confrontation Strategy. Good morning, and uh, if you'll forgive me, I have to put my laptop up here, so it's going to be a little weird, and I'll... How's the audio? Is that okay still? Hey, oh, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> could advance the slides. That'd be a good idea. All right, good morning. Thank you so much for coming, and I, um, I know everyone's sort of frantically trying to figure out how they're going to fly out of DCA today, but I, I think is, I, don't, I haven't checked on this, the state of cancellation, so um, feel free to ignore me if you need to check on your flight. Um, but uh, okay, so so I, what I want to say is um, this paper the, the, it comes as a result of uh, what happens when people from two different disciplines write a paper together, and I'm I'm actually quite proud of the work, not because it's any good, um, but because it reminds me of the thrill of doing research across disciplines. And I just I want to say I'd like to remind any of us um, and anybody in here who will hear me about this, academics or the information security community or really any community where there's some sort of rock star mentality about it's one researcher who gets it right and publishes all the good things. That's a load of crap. Um, and so disciplinary, interdisciplinary work is really the only good work left in this space. Um, we can't afford to be doing any more monotone solutions um, to what is really just quite a complex um, social, technological problem. And so uh, my colleague couldn't be here today, uh, Mike uh, Peterson, and it's kind of a bummer because he is the Russian expert, which is probably why you're all here, um, but I'm the social scientist. Um, so all of the mistakes that get made today in today's presentation are likely my fault. Um, but since Mike isn't here, I'm going to take the liberty of saying that all the mistakes in this presentation are his. Um, so, uh, so I've already been introduced, but I do want to say, I give a shout out to, to the co-author of this paper. So he's the director, Dr. Michael Peterson, of the Russia Maritime Studies Institute at the Naval War College. We are both co-located at uh, an institute called the Strategic and Operational Research Department, and I'm at the Cyber and Innovation Policy Institute, also inside SORD. Um, so that being said, um, what's the title of the slide? Okay, so there are two essential confusions. So as Mike and I started to talk to each other, um, we, there were two essential confusions we had um, in trying to sort through what am I supposed to be scared about? What am I supposed to be thinking about in terms of national security, and in particularly military policy regarding responses to the, the probing and poking from, from Russia specifically? Um, and so we ran into some fuzziness here. One of them is that um, the use of cyber techniques, tactics, and procedures is cheap, and it's, uh, it requires much less resourcing than we would like. Um, and that makes it harder for us to figure out who's doing it, how they're doing it, that sort of thing, right? So it's really, it's really just sort of fuzzy in general to, to kind of pin it down as a capability. And then the second problem we're having is that, um, is that it appears that Russia has a different interpretation of conflict and war than we do. Um, and that's problematic because we really want to have a clear understanding of what violates, when are we in conflict, when is this war, when is this peace? And so the net result of these two sort of fuzzinesses is that when we get these uh, digital pokes and prods, we're not really quite sure what to do about them and whether or not it's in the military lane specifically to do anything about it. Um, so Mike and I take a somewhat um, controversial position on this, or maybe it isn't, um, but Mike and I are not terribly uh, concerned uh, from a military standpoint about information operations. 
um, we have greater concerns on the technical side than the psychological side. And, and so I'll explain why that's the case, and then you can all sort of object. Um, so the paper, and if you, if you decide to download it, um, draws an explicit connection between information confrontation, which is uh, a concept that's embedded in Russian strategic doctrine. Um, and within that doctrine, um, there's an essential dis distinction between technical information and psychological effects. And we decided that it would be helpful, we think it's analytically helpful, to use that as a way to think about how the Russians are doing what they do to our systems. Either one, technical, or two, psychological. Not that those are fully separable, but we think that's, we think that's a good way to sort through what we're seeing coming from them. Um, and so we think that's a good way to sort of start solving some of that second fuzziness. And then the first one I thought, okay, if we can kind of cut through and understand a little more strategically what the Russians are doing with the second point, the first point's still there. So if we're not going to look at it from the, from the angle of technological sophistication, since you can rent this stuff for five dollars, um, maybe we should look at it differently. And so I thought, well, maybe organizational sophistication. So I thought, okay, so I'll talk a little bit about organizational sophistication and we'll see if that gets us any, any footing. Um, so let's move forward. All right, so let me talk first about the cheapness, the ease of attack. Um, and for those of you who know cyber well enough, this is not news to you, um, but it allows me to call out some of the really good research that's getting done by the private sector. So um, it turns out that breaches and exploits um, really doesn't take very much to execute. It takes a few people, some resources, and a few dollars. Um, the uh, circle up here, oops, sorry. This is me learning how to use this thing. The circle up here is um, the result of, interestingly enough and ironically, Kaspersky's good work on dark markets. Um, and so it turns out if you wanted to do about uh, 10,000 seconds of a DDoS attack, it'll cost you $60. That's not a lot, right? And so if you're looking to disrupt a particular website, a particular system, $60 isn't, isn't uh, that's not regime level funding, right? That's probably just a little bit more than what you spend on Amazon Prime after you've had a few drinks. So, so this is not an issue, right? So, okay, so we have this problem, and it makes it really hard for us to think about um, what to take seriously once cyber is a service, right? You can, if you can rent it, then it's open to individuals, groups, and regimes alike. And I actually, I want to call out Kaspersky did work here. Um, per Luigi Paganini at Security Affairs does amazing work on dark markets if you're interested. Um, and also Brian Krebs' work, always really remarkable on dark markets, the pricing, how that um, is being shaken up by, uh, by uh, white markets. Um, so anyway, so, so this is easy. All right, if it's easy and cheap, then it's not going to help me get any analytical clarity. The second problem we're having is that these essential distinctions between what is conflict and what isn't, this is a very, um, this is a dominant power luxury, right? We have, the United States has been the military dominant power for a very long time, and so of course we've written what we think conflict is and is not, right? This is just, this is a, this is a position we have. We're status quo oriented, we want the system to be ours, and so therefore we have drawn these distinctions and we adhere to them because it's how we like the system to be. That does not then mean that lesser powers have to hold those distinctions, right? And in fact, if you're a revisionist lesser power, if you'd like the world to change, you're going to use those distinctions and start messing with them to mess with the dominant power. So strategically speaking, it makes perfect sense that the Russians are messing around with the definition of what conflict is. There's more going on, though, for the Russians. So they're not just blurring what conflict is and is not, right? They're, they're starting to blur within their own domestic population um, who does the work, state and sub-state stuff. Um, when are we at peace? When are we at war? That distinction's weird for them. Um, and then who soldiers are, who citizens are. And then for them, it's not so much about conventional and non-conventional, right? But it's essentially this notion of non-linear warfare. And I have a slide on that if you want to see it later on, but uh, the Canadians do good work in this space. Um, so, so let's go to this next step. It's funny because I keep trying to click here instead of here. Aha. All right. So, um, so this is a case study at hand, and this is actually, um, I, yes, I'm aware it's referred to Russia as a lesser power because it is, but Mike Peterson, it totally is. Mike Peterson um, has done a lot of work on what's called the deinstitutionalization of modern Russia. Um, and so this is really where Mike shines forward, and I really wish he was here to represent himself. Um, so I'm going to try and do some version of this work for him. Um, and so if I read a little more than that, it's, it's, it's because I'm trying to represent his ideas quite poorly. Um, but essentially, um, 
under Putin, institutional boundaries have become porous and it allows private citizens and organizations to conduct what we're what we like to understand is state state sanctioned activities, right? So these functions are now being outsourced and pushed downward into warlords, militias, gangsters, individuals, and increasingly for Russia, hackers, right? And that's not that's not specific to Russia, that's the world, right? So the North Koreans uh, push a lot of efforts out to um, hired hackers, um, and the Chinese are creating their own hacker army. And so it's not surprising to see this happen. But within Russia specifically, this deinstitutionalization is quite robust. Interesting. There it is. Okay, so um, I just want to make sure that other picture shows up. All right. Um, so what you're looking at here, the top picture um, is an actual member of the Nightwolf Biker Gang, and the Nightwolf Biker Gang is um, has a strong relationship with Putin himself. Um, they started out primarily as a biker gang, a pro-Soviet uh, biker gang, but have since morphed into a kind of paramilitary, an extension to do um, either spread propaganda or sometimes do protest. Um, they stormed the Ukrainian naval base um, and a gas facility during the Russian invasion of Crimea, so they did function semi-militarily, um, or and they popped up in Montenegro in 2016 to try and attempt the failed coup by pro-Russianists. Um, so it's an interesting example of how um, a global leader has a strong relationship with, um, with a, a biker gang. Um, the second example down below is uh, the blue Lincoln Continental that belongs to a guy named Yevgeny Prigozhin. If you're familiar with the guy at all, Yevgeny graduated high school um, with plans to become a cross-country skier, uh, but his skiing career fell apart in 81 when he was sentenced to 12 years of prison for robbery, fraud, and by involving minors in prostitution. Um, so he served nine of those years, was freed in 1990, um, just as the Soviet Union was collapsing. He becomes a, uh, becomes a seller of hot dogs thereafter, um, opens a couple of food courts, and then in 98, he opens the New Island Restaurant, which is, um, which is referred to as St. Petersburg's only floating luxury restaurant ship. And this is where he meets Putin for Putin's birthday, um, and that relationship gets established, and I'll talk to you about Prigozhin here in a second. All right, so we've got deinstitutionalization, We've got, um, we've got this, this, this emerging thought coming from the military community called information confrontation. And so we've got deinstitutionalization and we've got this notion that all of a sudden everything, anything that, could, that can deteriorate politically we'll, we, we'll use as a weapon, right? And so the quote from Gerasimov, the chief of Russian general staff is, the role of non-military means in achieving political and strategic goals has grown. And in many cases, they have exceeded the power of the force of weapons in their effectiveness. So the Russian position is now we will hire everybody and information is probably more effective than military power. So where are the Russians headed? They create two subsets in this in information confrontation. One is information psychological, the other is information technical. All right, let's look at uh, the case studies and I'll talk you through the case studies really quick. An example of the information psychological is the, is the um, is the Cyber Burkut, which is uh, um, a hacktivist group that that, um, that the Russians hire now and again to, to distribute their propaganda. Um, that's a troll, that's the private troll army that they've used to do things. Um, and then in addition, there's the, um, there's the Internet Research Agency, the IRA. Um, the Internet Research Agency has also been a private army of trolls they rent on a regular basis in order to be able to spread or disrupt um, political, in particular, the 2016 U.S. political election. Um, so, and, so the IRA and, the, and Cyber Burkut are two really good examples of not just deinstitutionalization, but this attempt to use the information psychological. Okay? But both of those cases, in, in this particular, um, the IRA, which was funded um, by our prior friend with the, with the blue Lincoln Continental, Yevgeny Prigozhin, are highly separable, easily deniable, and, and are, are stood up and put down at a moment's notice. There's no sophistication to that organization. It doesn't have to last very long. Cyber Book could alone um, dissolved and re-upped re itself uh, twice. Um, as its members were so unprofessional that they doxed each other on pastebin, full addresses, names, and emails, as they, gave into, as, as they started to squabble with one another. This is not something that a regime wants to have, right, in a long-term strategic effort to do anything meaningful to its adversary. It's disruptive, it's problematic, I get that, but there's no sophistication to that organization. In contrast, if you think about what the APTs are doing, both Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear, you're talking about 
not just technologically sophisticated work, which is great, that's fine, but it's also easily rentable. It's the case that those organizations have been around since 2001, 2002, 2003. The regime has been building out platforms that are modular for them. They have had institutional support. They have been held close to the regime, both in terms of protection um, and deniability. And there's a lot at risk for the things they do as they attempt to launch SCADA attacks on, its, on neighboring countries. There's a lot of sophistication that comes not just from the technology, but just from the lifespan, the length, the amount of support the regime is willing to pour in so that it's stable not just during the operation, but between operations. That's what we're worried about. Not just because it's technical, and not just because these are in, uh, infrastructure attacks, but because that the, the regime has made a very specific choice to keep these things stable, to keep them close, and to grow them over time. We are not, my colleague and I are not, not concerned as much about the information operations because we see it as something that the regime is not fully committed to in the long run. Now, controversially, I also think we're going to learn our way out of information operations. But second, what we do see is that the regime has decided that it wants to triple down and protect its APT functions. And that's what we're concerned about. So if you want to ask me, what should a military pol policy be regarding uh, Russian pokes and prods? I would say you need to look at the sophistication of whichever organization they're protecting and then target that. Go at that. And don't spend any other time, don't waste your time trying to figure out how to militarily work on information operations. That's a zone that's left to other things. All right, and I'll stop there. And my Russian specialist isn't here, so you guys have to get bury all your Russian questions. Hi. Um, I guess my question would be, which agencies on the civilian side are best positioned, especially given that we have such a patchwork and overlapping authorities and, yeah. you know, the constant turf wars just on the traditional technical side of computer network defense? Who should be leading that and what's the best way? For the for the information psychological or yes, the information yeah, yeah. The information so, yeah. So which civilian agencies to combat that and how how should they work most effectively? So I so frankly I think that um, information operations the way they scale up are in exponential rides on the back of the social media firms that that allow that propagation. So I, frankly I think it's going to come down to the regulation of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I think that's how that works. And and we can see rap we can see. Facebook trying to find its way out of this problem, right? We can see Facebook doing its best to show an effort to say it's not our fault that this is going on. But if you were to regulate, I'm not saying censor, I'm not saying censor, right? But if you regulate the, what, what they do with their content, we could, we could stop a viral attack before, we, before it got started. Those capabilities can be built into their platforms. This is not about, this is about making our systems more robust and resilient, right? There's no reason to attack another country because we commit an own goal. That's, that's on us. And so, you know, th are we going to regulate social media? We do need to regulate social media. Yeah. That's my, that's my opinion. <laughs> Not the opinion of the Naval War College, the, the Department of the Navy, DOD. Sorry. <laughs> I don't work for Facebook either, so there's that. I have a question. Okay. Um, thanks for your great presentation. I'm curious about <coughs> you mentioned something about deniability between mm. the Russian government and the APTs. <coughs> is that the primary motivation behind the regime's forming of these relationships with these groups? Like, why not just make it a military function, right? Like, why work with these APTs? And how deniable is it? And does, deniabil d does deniability decline over time as the government pours more and more resources into maintaining these organizations over the long term? Yeah, I like this question. So, and I love the I love the temporal aspect of this. On a long enough timeline, um, right? And this was this is definitely just this goes all the way down to attribution. On a long enough timeline, you do stuff. You'll be it'll be traced back to you. And I think uh, so that deniability on the APT side. I'm glad Mike's not here because he denies this up and down. Um, but I, 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 from what we saw happening in Ukraine, I think that's active experimentation on the Ukraine industrial systems in order to, we know the platforms are modular, which means you can take the attack that, they, that they've been experimenting on the Ukrainian system 
and you can adjust it for different SCADA systems, right? So it suggests to me that over time, they're not going to be as worried about deniability, and they're thinking about this as a military function, um, which frankly, so is the United States, right? Um, so it's not, that's, it's not that big of a surprise. The deniability on the information operations side, those weak ties, uh, you know, I think, again, over time, I don't think anyone is, I think anyone who works in that space, I'm not, I'm not sure the deniability matters um, on the information operations side. I think there's too much emotion wrapped in there, and I think that emotion tends to override the rational attribution of things, and so even if we knew for a fact that it's them, the emotional side says, yes, but I'm still angry about this. And so it has its effect no matter what you do. Um, but definitely, I think over time, those APT functions that Russia has are intended to be military and will, will be brought closer into the regime. Yeah. Thanks. I'd like to pull the thread on your previous comment. Yeah. On the scale of censorship and free speech. Mm -hmm. Where where does um, what was your term uh, for social media mo moderating it or Oh sure, yeah, regulated it. Regulating right, it. Sure. Thank you. Where does that fall? So this is um, again, I'm glad Mike's not here because Mike uh, objects entirely to the notion that we would regulate social media in some way. Um, so I think I think in the notion between the the edges of free speech and full censorship I'm not going to reject the distinction. I'm going to say that I want that, that it's it is it is a form of limiting speech. It is, um, but when a, when when content that to have in a, in an environment where content goes viral, the virality, the exponentiality of the nature of social media, when it when something goes viral and, and can so quickly get out of control, um, that's a space where we need to find a way to intervene. And so in that sense, um, I'm not saying don't allow people to. There is a sophisticated way in which you can say, I will allow you to post your ideas to the internet, right? But there is also a way in which if you allow that, if it becomes viral and starts to kick out of control, um, there needs to be a way to throttle that. There needs to be a way to throttle that into a space where there can be usable dialogue and conversation and not just a lot of hate thrown around. So once that emotion component gets kicked up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's and that in, in my instinct um, is that that's what the that's what the platforms are trying to do is they're trying to look at not not the words themselves um, so not whichever set of words you say whether it's pro or anti anything but the way in which that particular set of words is being propagated and once you reach hyper propagation you might want to look at it for its content and make a decision thereafter about whether or not that needs to go away so it's it's more about the footprint of the spread than it is about the content itself oh, I think we're out of time I will ask I will talk privately sure oh I have to, I have to wait here <laughs> Uh, Nina, on behalf of the Army Cyber Institute, thank you so much for your thoughts I appreciate today. it. Thank yeah. you. Our final presenter is Major General Retired John Davis. Major General da Retired John Davis is a Vice President and the Federal Chief Security Officer at Palo Alto Networks, where he is responsible for cybersecurity initiatives and global policy for the public sector to better prevent cyber attacks around the world. Major General Retire Davis will be presenting his paper, Beyond the UNGGE Norms of Responsible Nation State Behavior in Cyberspace. Good morning, everyone. Uh, before I get started here on uh, Talking about the paper, uh, I need to give you a little bit of background and, and one caveat, um, just for context. To explain what in the world I'm doing uh, talking about norms of responsible state behavior. So uh, I was, before this job, I was in the military for 35 years. Most of that was special ops and information warfare. Uh, but the last decade was uh, were assignments related to cyber operations, cyber strategy, cyber policy, 
uh, interagency cyber coordination and international cyber cooperation initiatives. And during that last uh, assignment in the Pentagon, the last three and a half years of my career, uh, I participated in a lot of discussions, uh, both formal track one, government to government, as well as track 1.5, government, industry, and academia, all combined between the U.S. and China. And uh, it was very difficult finding a counterpart for me in China, in the, in the People's Liberation Army. But over time, over the course of about three years, I was able to determine who that was and extend an invitation to a female two-star general, uh, General Hao Ye Li, to come to the Pentagon and talk about cyber-related issues. It took me three and a half years to, uh, to get her to the Pentagon, uh, but I was successful in doing that, and we began a relationship, and, uh, and then we both retired. So after retiring in 2015, she reached out to me and invited me to Beijing to talk about cyber-related issues, and she started this forum, a uh, forum to discuss strategic stability, to discuss issues uh, regarding rules of the road, uh, in an effort that through her think tank, the China Institute for International Strategic Studies, uh, we built this forum out to involve other think tanks like CSIS, East West Institute, uh, other uh, industry uh, participants like Zhihu 360 in China and uh, Microsoft, and, uh, and a variety of other, you know, I would call it a track two minus, mostly academic and industry with some occasional limited government participation. And I've been involved with, with, with that for the past three years with the blessing of, uh, of both the Obama and Trump administrations um, as a uh, conduit of communication uh, below the formal dialogue, which, by the way, is very limited these days on the issues of, of cyber. So as a result of that past three years of experience, I've been working on this with my former counterpart in the China PLA, uh, General Hao Ye Li, and others. Uh, the caveat is this is a work in progress. It is by no means complete, but I think you might find some of the ideas uh, interesting. So uh, I'm going to quickly go through this as an agenda. Uh, you can find more detail in the paper. Characterization of what I think the most famous of the discussions about norms is under the UN Group of Government Experts over the past several years, talking about what states should and shouldn't do. But this is going beyond that, and what I'm going to focus on is offering five new norms of responsible uh, behavior that, that I believe uh, nation states should abide by. And, and then uh, concluding by why I think this is practical and not just a bunch of idealistic uh, uh, notions. I think that uh, the culmination of the UNGGE effort was when Presidents Xi and Obama met in September 2015. And the idea behind what states should and shouldn't do uh, was discussed at a presidential level, and there were some agreements made back then. Not that they're still sticking as, as well as we would all like, but, but they stuck back then. And I think uh, following that, the Group of Seven and Group of Twenty uh, nations, uh, there was some endorsement of those, uh, those norms. Since then, though, they have kind of fallen apart for various reasons, but I think they've been useful. And, I, and my effort to, to, to propose these new norms is not meant to belittle that effort or say that wasn't good. I think that was a good, uh, that was a good discussion and a good start. But I think there are other things that we should be talking about besides those norms. And just to remind you, uh, these were the UNGE GGE norms that uh, responsible states should be doing. Uh, the one here I will highlight, though, is the third one, uh, cooperating on information exchange to regarding criminal and terrorist threats. I'm going to reinforce that in one of my norms, but I'm going to go beyond what this says. And then, of course, probably more famously, what states shouldn't do. These were the should not do, including the most famous of all, which was the G obama agreement not to steal intellectual property for profit which, as I mentioned, I think at the time was an agreement that, uh, that was by and large bought into uh, for various reasons and has since, I'm not so sure that it's, it's continued. 
what I'm going to do with these norms is uh, try to achieve these, these outcomes. These are the outcomes I'm trying to achieve. Uh, contribute to an improved understanding at various levels. Reen this is very important. Reinforce positive and careful control and oversight of cyber activities. Bring additional responsible partners to the effort besides just government. And then reduce risk, and this is ultimately the, 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 the most important outcome, reduce risk and chances of misinterpretations that can lead to mistakes and escalation. And that's the reason that my former colleague in the PLA and I have such an interest in this, is this is a common interest item for both U.S. and China to lead on the world stage and to hopefully get other responsible nations to follow suit. Okay, the first norm. We need to be more transparent. And there are a number of practical reasons for this. This, I'm, I'm going to tell you right up front, this will not apply to espionage related activities. The world of intelligence, just put it off to the side. But when you're talking about law enforcement, domestic security, and especially uniformed military forces engaging in cyber related activities, we need to be more transparent about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And there's no expectation of total transparency. But why is this important? Well, we're, we're in, in one case, if you think about what we're discussing in today's world, it was impossible to even do that outside of a classified setting just a couple of years ago. The bar for classification of cyber-related activities, at least within those functions, law enforcement, homeland security, and, and military, that bar is lowering. And I think that's appropriate. Number two. Attribution is becoming less difficult. And so it is just a matter of you know, the way the world is moving in the, in the digital age, in the, wor in the world of information and technology, um, it's becoming more difficult to hide. So you need to explain what you're doing. Uh, and and there, there are actually uh, good examples of that because if you look at what but I did uh, from 2012 to 2015 in that effort to engage my counterpart in China to explain why we were building U.S. Cyber Command, what the forces missions were in general terms, how we were going to exercise control and oversight of that to try to you know, reduce the, the amount of uncertainty and the chances of making mistakes and misinterpretations and to try to increase stability, and because another very practical reason is, if you don't talk about what you're doing, you can't use it as a deterrence. So there was a very practical reason in being more transparent about what we were doing. More recently, uh, the Department of Defense openly acknowledged that it was conducting cyber operations against ISIS. Uh, now, that happened to be a, a, an opportune way to kind of break into a more transparent use of this and, and discussion of it because who likes ISIS? But, but it gave the department an opportunity once again to be more transparent and to leverage that transparency in terms of uh, deterrent effect. Second norm, uh, we need to be more careful about what we're doing and we need proper oversight, accountability, and control. And so, you know, these, this is about risk management procedures uh, that contribute to these outcomes. Domestic and foreign policy uh, oversight so that you understand the implications. Technical oversight to verify confidence. And there's, there's two different types. One, the technical gain loss is if this is discovered and it's not meant to be discovered, what are the implications associated with what, how it can be leveraged back against you or your, your partners and friends? And the other is an assurance level. How, are we, how confident are we? What's the level of assurance that this particular cyber capability is going to result in the type of effects that are desired? And how are we going to control that to make sure there aren't un, unintended consequences? There's operational oversight to verify positive control under a, an established chain of command. Intelligence oversight to understand the risks and loss associated with potentially damaging insight that you might put at risk by using capabilities. And then finally, legal oversight. And there are two types of legal oversight. The first is for the operation or activity itself. Is it within the law of armed conflict or appropriate international agreements? And the second is more at a technical level concerning 
the legality of the technical capability itself. Once again, I'm saying this applies to military, law enforcement, and domestic security, and not necessarily intelligence. Should it apply to intelligence? Yes, absolutely. Because I think there are a lot of intelligence-related cyber activities that appear as a, uh, a preparation for more nefarious you know, wartime or, or other activities, but I just think uh, bringing the intelligence aspect of this into the discussion will complicate it and slow it down. So for now, I've put intelligence off to the side again. The third, responsible, the, the third norm is that we should, and this uh, gets back to uh, a discussion of uh, uh, our first presenter. Uh, we should be sharing information about criminal and terrorist threats of common interest. And this is the, you know, not just information, but intelligence. And I'm talking about defining what type of information we should be talking about, and that's indicators of compromise and contextual information. Not personally identifiable information, not protected health information, not IP, not content. I'm talking about information directly related to criminal and terrorist cyber threats. And this should be uh, government to government across all of those different functions, but that's not sufficient. It should also go between gover government and industry, industry to government, and across industry. It needs to be standardized, format standardized, so that it can be automated. That's the only way it will be effective. Passing PDF files and doing it word of mouth is not fast enough to keep up with the speed and the scale of these cyber threats because they are largely automated. And finally, why, why is this a norm? It's because there is so much noise out there, as the first presenter mentioned. This, there's an enormous amount of noise. And if you want to you know, reduce the noise to signal ratio so that responsible nations are better better understand what's important in the environment and don't get confused or distracted by all this noise, then, then there is a common interest in all responsible nations to reduce that noise so that they reduce the chance of miscalculation or, or making a mistake and getting into an escalatory process. That's why this is important. The fourth norm, we need to bring more effective partners in and industry you know, I apologize for the, the crowding on the slide. Industry owns, operates, and maintains the vast majority of this environment we call cyberspace. Yet, most of the discussion about norms has been focused only within government channels. Industry's voice is critical in this because the discussion will bring more practical solutions to other norms that need to be decided, and because guess who's going to be the enforcement point for all of this? Industry is going to be the enforcement point for these norms. There are many current issues that deserve industry's voice. I've listed some of them. Mandatory backdoors, cross-border data flows, hackback, supply chain risk management. There are a number of issues that need, that need industry's voice at the table in order to come up with effective, practical, and enforceable norms of responsible behavior beyond those that I'm talking about here. And there's an increasing interest in both academia and, and industry. Uh, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute has done a lot of great work in this. Carnegie Endowment for International Peace uh, has done some work specific to the financial sector. And uh, uh, in, there are industry uh, voices out there, such as Microsoft, Symantec, that are wanting to get involved in, the, in this discussion. And my suggestion is responsible nations should encourage and incentivize this participation. And finally, the last norm, this is the only one that sh it falls into the should not category. And this goes back to what uh, Nina was talking about. Um, responsible nations should not employ loosely controlled third party actors and organizations to do their bidding. And these, you can see what the categories are, and you're seeing, we're seeing a growing number of them being leveraged by certain nation states today, not the U.S., surrogates, front companies, technical research companies, even moonlighters, you know, think China, and patriotic hackers, China and Russia, uh, 
the reason that this is so dangerous is because it increases uncertainty, reduces stability. There is no, you know, solid control and oversight of, of these organizations. They're, they can be driven by questionable motivations. And the chance of making a mistake and mi misattribution is, is increasingly alarming to me. People used to ask me what kept me up at night. What kept me up at night was the chance of a mistake, that one of these third-party organizations doing something either intentionally with a bad motivation or accidentally and it getting out of control and uh, responsible nations overreacting to that and getting into e escalation. So I think that this is a common interest item for all responsible nation states. And it's something, you know, I'm not being unrealistic. I don't think you can eliminate this, but I think we should make it very, very difficult for nations to continue to do this. So those are the outcomes based on, uh, you know, the norms that I have proposed. These norms have been met with uh, optimism by my Chinese uh, counterparts. They like them. They publish this in Chinese press. Uh, I'm going to continue to work this. I've, of course, back briefed the U.S. government on these. And, and guess what? If you haven't caught on by now, these are things the U.S. is already doing. These aren't new for our country. Uh, Norm 1 and 2, have, the U.S. military has been leading uh, this effort uh, since 2012. Norm 3 and 4, Congress, the congressional law in 2015 were designed to support those norms. Um, increasing public-private uh, partnerships uh, from, for Norm uh, 3 and 4, there's, there are increasing public-private efforts in order to do that. And, and by the way, on that issue of uh, sharing information about threats of common interest, criminal and terrorist threats. It was interesting for me to find out that in China, the last time I was there to, to discuss this and present it in Beijing this past fall, um, I asked China, the Cyber Administration of China, what is, is an example, what's your standard for information sharing? They said, actually, the information sharing relationship China has with uh, South Korea and Japan despite all the friction in other areas, is one of the most effective common interest information sharing, cyber threat uh, information sharing relationships that they have. So it is definitely possible to do this even when there are other tensions between, between countries. And then finally, as I mentioned, that last norm, I believe every responsible nation has a common interest in, in preventing the, the loose nature of that because of the risk of of making mistakes. As I mentioned, um, these are not complete by any means, but they are things that the, the United States is already doing, and we, I believe that we have a responsibility to partner with other nations out of common interest in order to try to, uh, to make these the, the norm, make these the rules of the road for all responsible nations, and I personally think the U.S. and China could lead the way in some of these. That's why I continue to try to support this effort. So with that, I'll stop, and uh, I guess we have a couple more minutes just to take questions. So as you were just saying, the U.S. government has, of course, already taken action on a lot of these. How much benefit, you know, number five aside, where, you know, perhaps that would be illegal in some places, but for a norm like number one, so uh, <clears throat> on transparency, how much benefit do you think the U.S. ultimately gets, even if it's just sort of adopted unilaterally, or how much of this is really necessary to be more internationally or more community-wide? How much does the U.S. get out of it? So perhaps, I mean, that would be my first question, or, you know, how much benefit is there? Okay, so let's have that be a two-part question then, because I think that was a smart response. You know, how much benefit would the U.S., get out of it by continuing to unilaterally perhaps be more transparent so even if China weren't, they would still understand more about our thinking? And then how much benefit would there be more internationally, even if only the U.S. does it versus a wider group of nations? Okay. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, two perspectives here. One, I think, as I mentioned, I, I think we're being drug in that direction regardless of whether or not we, we like it or find benefit in it. The way the environment works now, 
it is just very difficult. You're going to be found out. Attribution is not the bar, high bar that it used to be. In fact, uh, the, because attribution has traditionally been a challenge, the U.S. and our ally intelligence community have developed capabilities to be able to see across, you know, not just SIGINT, but across all the intelligence and open source capabilities in order to attribute very well, more than you would think, Be getting very good at it, and so are other nations, by the way. And the other thing is the private sector. I mean, our threat intelligence capability at Palo Alto Networks, I would put it up against anything the government has today. And a lot of, a lot of our analysts come from, from government, and we, we don't sell threat intelligence. We provide it as a public good. But I think we're being drug in that direction. Um, but here's the, it, another thing that I think is happening, a big dynamic is most of the sophisticated cyber capabilities that we know of grew up in darkness and anonymity. They grew up in the world of espionage and in crime. And now that you have law enforcement, homeland security or domestic security, and especially the uniformed military operating in these arenas, I think it's it's a benefit to every nation to become more transparent, regardless of whether we're being drugged in that direction or not, and we are, but I think it's a benefit to be, to be more transparent, the same way that we are in the military about other forms of you know, military action. And I don't think it's a matter of militarizing cyberspace. I think you know, we, we don't militarize the ocean because we have a Navy. We have responsibilities as responsible nations uh, in terms of national security, to protect our national security interests. And so I think that's, you know, both of those aspects, uh, I think, are reasons that, that not just the U.S., but all responsible nations are being drugged in that direction and should be. It, it's appropriate. Does that answer your question? Okay. Morning, sir. Uh, Major Eric Holbrooks. I'm the cyber exchange officer for the Germans, or the German new uh, cyber command. My question is with norms and values. For Western society, we generally probably pretty much agree with these, but you have actors such as Russia and others that may not agree what a norm or a value is. And they play in the gray zones, um, or they may twist a law or regulation. My question is, how do you, how would we, as a conglomerate of Western value nations, how would we deal with those nations to get them to start playing with the same norms and values as us? Um, it's difficult. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be a long process. I think, personally, the key to success is getting them to realize what's in it for them. What's in it, if, if you abide by these norms, for the most part, there are going to be, there are going to be cheaters, there are going to be covert operations, we know that. But in general terms, abiding by these norms produces the type of outcomes that I'm trying to achieve here. If you can get them to see what's in it for them, you might be able to make progress. That's my effort with China. And it, it, um, I believe the U.S. and China have common interest in doing this, and I believe China is Maybe China doesn't necessarily believe there's a, an operational benefit by abiding by these, but they might see a stature benefit by participating with the United States on the global stage as a leader, a bilateral effort to, to lead in the development of rules of the road in cyberspace for certain functions. I think that's the hook for China. They, that's where they benefit. They, it gives them a, a chance, a, you know, equality with the United States as a superpower in cyberspace. So I think you have to be wise about going through this. You have to be patient. This is going to take a long time. But the fact that the U.S. is already doing this, I think it makes it a no-brainer for us. Uh, we just have to convince others that it's to their benefit to do, to do the same. More of a comment than a question to, to add to your angst about point five. Is this on? There it is. There's a gentleman named Graham Allison who gave a great TED talk in September uh, asking the question, is war with China inevitable? And he cites figures over the last 600 years saying that there have been 16 instances of a rising power and a ruling power. 
and they had this, this uh, tension between them. War resulted in 12 of the 16 instances, not because of one of the actions of the rising or the ruling power, but because some third party provoked an incident that caused those two powers to go to war. And based on what you were saying in the, your fifth point, I thought you might find that interesting. Again, Grant Allison's his name, TED Talk. I as I mentioned, that was my worst nightmare. I mean, that's the thing that I worried about more than a deliberate attack, uh, a, a deliberate um, uh, action on the part of a, of, a, of a potential adversary or adversary. I was worried that we were going to be drug into a situation because, because it's so muddy out there in cyberspace. And you got all these loosely controlled third parties that just magnify the chance of a mistake. Yes, sir. Sir, um, my question really gets back to sort of one and two uh, the, of your norms. New strategy, defend forward, persistent engagement, but really, I guess, in your thinking, what's the level of detail that we should sort of uh, attach or talk about with those two concepts? I mean, to this point, we've been fairly vague about them, as you saw yesterday with General Stewart in the, in the question there. Well, uh, to a certain degree, once again, this is an opportunity by being more transparent about what our strategy is. It provides an opportunity to signal and to, to, uh, to uh, give us perhaps more deterrent options available in the military kit bag as opposed to the full suite of capabilities, diplomatic, economic, law enforcement, intelligence. Uh, it, it's being able to uh, talk with a little bit more clarity about what the military tool looks like and, and the, the uh, uh, priority that it's being given. Um, but I will say, despite the more aggressive leaning posture, the uh, control, accountability, and oversight are still elements of, of of that ability to employ uh, military capability and always will be. They might be streamlined a little bit. The, the control and authority might be delegated, and I, I think they are, because, for example, by publicly declaring uh, cyber operations against ISIS, that has enabled the military to do more things with more capability and, over time, better assurance that what the military says it's going to do with these in fact, we're gaining confidence that, yes, it, it in fact can be controlled, uh, escalation uh, consequences can be managed, and leaders are becoming more comfortable in delegating decision making. I've been told that w what once used to be approved at very, very senior levels in this particular instance is now, been, uh, is now being approved at much lower levels. So it doesn't mean that the process isn't there. It's still there but we've been able to streamline it and perhaps make it a little bit more agile. I guess to follow up, um, when you read the new uh, joint call on cyber operations, you talk about access, you talk about the constraints faced and, and the fact that an adversary may be on a uh, device versus having control over it, et cetera, but yet when we bring out the Uh, I think that's I think that's part of it. I do. I think that's fair. I think that's part of it. Okay. I think I'm I'm out of time. Thank you very much. I really appreciated uh, sharing those thoughts with you.